everybody know that we were going to do that and hope you had the chance to make preparations for that. I have a question for you. What will tomorrow hold? What will tomorrow hold? As the latest news rolled out, a recommendation from the President of the United States that the shelter in place would continue not just for a couple more weeks, but through the end of April. Stephanie turned to me this past week and said, it seems like we're living in the day after tomorrow movie or something like that. Some kind of crazy sci-fi movie, Michael. What's going on? It seems now that for the foreseeable future, schools are going to not reopen until August. Mass layoffs, firings, businesses shuttering, closing the doors, perhaps for the last time they had their doors open. Our hearts are heavy with news of of doctors in distress, even a doctor in Italy taking her life. So we're just wondering, what will tomorrow hold? And then at the lunch table yesterday, Hudson turned to me and he said, Dad, what day is it? So it's not only what will tomorrow hold, but we don't even know what day it is because everything seems to be blurring together. You know what I'm talking about? The placeholders in our schedules seem to have disappeared. And so if Sunday was sort of one of those placeholders where we get everybody together and we go to church, or Monday we begin the new week and the kids go off to school, or Wednesday night we go to Iwana, or on Thursday maybe you had volleyball practice or cheerleading practice, or maybe you had a basketball game on Saturday, and these placeholders have all suddenly disappeared, and it's this blurring of uncertainty and suffering. So not only does it feel like the day after tomorrow, but here, brothers and sisters, it's almost like it's Groundhog Day. (laughs) You know? What day is it? It's just on repeat, James. It's just on repeat. Keegan, it's like one, two, three, I don't know. It's just a day. It's another 24-hour period. The sun came up. The sun went down. My kids are going bananas in the house, and they can't even get on the playground at park, at the park. And so it seems like this blurring of uncertainty and suffering. And in all of that, we go, why? Why? Not only does it feel crazy, we just wonder why. And last week, we talked about why would God permit or allow this this to take place? And we asked What purpose is, what guide does God have for us in this season of suffering and uncertainty? What are his purposes behind that? We talked about that God is not the causative agent last Sunday behind illness, disease, death. Illness, disease, death, God takes no pleasure in that, but it's the result of sin and our rebellion against God all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve and all humankind, them as, and Adam as our federal head, we would have done just as he did if we were in his shoes because we're sinners just the same, and that's made clear in Romans chapter 5. So sin came into the picture and death as a result of sin, and from that, the world is beautiful yet obviously broken. But at the same time, though God does not take joy or pleasure in suffering, illness, or death, he permits it for a purpose, and he gives us guides for what we're going through. He gives us guides for this season, this blurring season of uncertainty and suffering. And so we're in this series called Why? Why? When suffering strikes. We're going to ask ourselves, but ultimately ask God through his word, what continuing guides does God have God have for us in this season of suffering? Last week we talked about a season of suffering is a time is a time to love, to love our neighbor and to love one another. It's a time to grow in patience and endurance and depth of soul. And it's a time not only to love and a time to grow in patience and endurance and depth of soul, but it's also a time to return nearer to God, time to draw nearer to God or maybe turn to God for the first time. But this week, we're going to see three more steps, three more guides that God gives us in seasons, blurring seasons of uncertainty and suffering. 
There was a man a long time ago who chronicled not just one book in the Old Testament, but two. His second book now places him in this setting of absolute desolation. It seems like all hope is lost. Not just one deportation to Babylon, not just two deportations to Babylon, but the third deportation to Babylon from the people of Judah has been taking place now. 605, 597, and 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and they hauled off the people of Judah, who were we call the southern kingdom. They had been for a season more faithful to God than the, their, their other nas- uh, national connected people to the north. But judgment came, Babylonians came in, and now we find Jeremiah alone, crying out to God in lamentation, because it seems like everything is gone. His family, undoubtedly, is gone. His friends, gone. Jerusalem is not just a place for a straggling group of remnants. It's in rubble, nothing but dust. And scholars debate where Jeremiah was at the point in time when he wrote his book short book, Lamentations, he was either there with a tiny little band of people in Jerusalem, or he was in Egypt, exiled, hiding out with just a few faithful followers of Yahweh. And in Jeremiah's book, Lamentations, which if you're like me, you might skip over Lamentations, you go, this is a big sob story. Jeremiah doesn't pull any punches punches in his sobbing, his crying, his lamenting before God. But in the centerpiece of his poetry, his song of lamentations to God, is the crux of the whole book. And that's how ancient Hebrew poetry worked. It, it did, it, it, unlike modern poetry, where we count on the main idea or the aha moment being at the end of the poem... Oftentimes, Hebrew poetry in a chiastic sort of structure would bring the key message of the entire song or poem in the middle, and everything pointed towards that apex, and that's how Lamentations, in its five chapters, there in the middle of chapter three, is the apex, is the heart song of Jeremiah's Lamentations. In this heart song of Jeremiah's Lamentation, we find three more guides from God for this season of uncertainty, this blurring season of uncertainty and suffering. So turn with me to Jeremiah's book, Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 17. It says this, My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. So I say, my strength has perished, and so has my hope from the Lord. You could look back on the previous two chapters and see all manner of description from Jeremiah's heart about everything that's lost. Everything, it seemed, that he held dear, that he cherished, that he loved is gone. It's just dust and rubble. And he had the same question as you and I face today. What will tomorrow bring? What will tomorrow bring? And even what day is it? He's just on his knees crying out to God. My happiness is gone. My peace is gone. I don't know what the future will hold. My hope seems to be gone. That hope that was so resolute in my heart, that trust that was resolute in my heart to God, it seems to be fractured, splintering. Then he continues in verse 19, remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. Some of you this past week found out that you were losing your job or getting laid off for an indefinite period of time. And of course, no check from the government has arrived in anybody's mailbox yet. And that rent bill or that mortgage payment or that empty fridge is screaming at you right now. Or maybe you're with a loved one And there in the other room, quarantine, you have to be in another part of the house because you don't want to get COVID-19 like they have it. Or your loved one is in a hospital and you can't even see them right now. 
Or maybe you're on the front lines in the medical professional field and you're a doctor or nurse, part of our church or in our community, and you are working 12 or 14 hour shifts, your family's never seeing you, and when you do come home, you set your clothes out in the garage, you just take a shower, you go straight to bed, you go back to the same thing the very next day because you don't want to infect your family with might be what might, you might already have and not know it or what, it's on your clothing or whatever. And everything's blurring together with this uncertainty and suffering. You might have a colleague who's passed away. You might know of a pastor who has coronavirus. And the first guide that God gives us in this blurring season of uncertainty and suffering is that it is a time to lament our losses. So often, people who confess Christ who attend church, who love God, put pat answers to the complex problems of life. But what we find is that the Bible deals with our emotions in a raw way, and it doesn't say, you know what, you need to shut down emotionally. You can't tell that to God. Instead, here is one of the key prophets of the entire Bible, Jeremiah, crying out, why, Lord, what is going on? I have terrors on every side. What's happening on the ground in the streets? Lie young and old. That's verse 21 of chapter 2. My virgins, my young men have fallen by the sword. You've, what, what's happening here? Jeremiah was seeing death everywhere. Lament. These blurring seasons of uncertainty and suffering are a time to lament our losses. Honestly before God. We can honestly lament to God, honestly, because we know that he's fully capable of receiving our lament, our sorrow, and guiding us through it. And he's not going to chide us for being human. He made us with these emotions. One of the big losses that we're facing right now is the loss of togetherness, this absence I can't even go see my parents, and they're only 35 miles away. You can't see the, the kids in the classroom that you want to teach. You can't gather here for the Lord's Supper on Sunday at Mayfair Bible Church. A loss of togetherness, a loss of community, even in your immediate family. It's okay. God's Word gives us clear permission, even guides us that in a season of uncertainty and suffering, it's time to lament our losses. To bow your soul down before God and to say, I hurt, this hurts, this is pain, this is real, it's deep in my soul. I remember a time many years ago when I was in basic training in this program called the Airland Emergency Resource Team. It was a 10-week basic training designed to mirror the Marine Corps basic training. It was run by a bunch of military veterans. <clears throat> and we could not get a phone call. We could not make a phone call. We could not receive a letter. For the first two and a half weeks, all communication was cut off. They even took our watches away. We didn't know what time it was. It was complete blurring of everything. It was just wake up at some point in time, early in the morning, when the drill instructor shouted at us to wake up. And then from that point forward, before the sun rose, all the way until after the sun went down, they told us what to do. And whatever came, we just had to do it. It was total blurring. And I remember deep within my soul, longing to just hear my mom's voice or hear my dad's voice or talk to my brother or my sister or talk to a friend. And it went on for day after day after day. And I remember two and a half weeks in, I finally was able to receive a letter from my mom. And I never cried over a letter until that point. I opened up this letter from my mom and tears just poured out. My mom loves me. I know God loves me. She's reminding that God is with me. I know that God will guide me through this. And the sense of absence of loss brings about a very healing lamentation. That God meets us in our tears and in our fears and in our questions. 
just as Jeremiah had lost everything and hurt and cried out. So today, we haven't lost everything, but we experience these losses, this loneliness, this absence, maybe loss of financial security or stability, loss of a sense of security, and we can lament. It's a time to lament before God and let the tears roll out before God and allow Him, invite Him to meet you there because He is there already waiting for you. He is with you. He loves you. He cares about you. The second step, the, the second guide in the season of uncertainty and suffering is that it is a time, it's a time to trust in God's integrity. It's a time to lament our losses, a time to trust in God's integrity. Look with me at verse 21. So after the lament pours out, his soul is bowed down. It says this, this I recall to my mind. You have to do that every once more. You have to recall it to your mind. Because though you may have the knowledge somewhere in your brain, it doesn't trickle down into the frontal part. You, it doesn't come up the first time you wake up in the morning. It's, it's not there, present in your heart. So you have to recall this to mind. Therefore, I have hope. What is he going to recall to mind and find hope in? It's this in verse 22. The Lord's Yahweh, the one true and only living God, the Lord's loving kindnesses never cease. They never fail you. This is this word, chesed, which if you've been a part of Mayfair Bible Church for any point in time, you've heard me pronounce that word that sounds like I'm spitting at you. It's one of the most beautiful world, words in the Hebrew language. It's my favorite word in the whole Old Testament. It's this word for God's unstoppable, always and forever covenant love toward his people. That God initiated this covenant with us and God is the keeper of the covenant for us. And we turn to him and we respond in trust. We respond in trust to God's integrity that he will hold his end of the covenant. We rely on him. He will keep us. He will guard us. And his loving kindnesses, this love will never stop. It's like waves upon a seashore that never stop, that never end. I was there on the shores of the Holloway Reservoir a couple weeks ago with my son Hudson. And we were watching those waves roll in. And F.F. F. Bruce said a long time ago, in his commentary in the Gospel of John, that that is a picture of God's grace. It's there, it washes over us, always present, continuing. This is what Jeremiah is shouting out. The loving kindness is the chesed, indeed, that it never stops. And then coupled together with God's loving kindnesses, which is grace, which is God's favor, kindness, saving grace in our lives, is his mercy, for it says, for his compassions never fail. Your translation might say, his mercies never fail. So by God's loving kindnesses, his, his grace, his position of grace toward us, he reaches down and offers forgiveness to us. And because of his mercy, we receive pardon. That's what compassion is speaking to. His mercies, his pardon, it never fails. It won't falter. It has integrity. You're not going to hit the ground if you're holding on to the lifeline of God's grace. That's why we just sang this song. You never let go. No, you never let go of me. Oh, no, you never let go. I enjoy rock climbing when I have time, rappelling when I have time. And here's a, a picture that I have of, this isn't me, but I, I have been in that position, hanging off the edge of a cliff by a rope. And some of you have maybe gone out to Grand Ledge and climbed there by the riverside on those limestone cliffs, or maybe you've gone to Planet Rock and you've done some rock climbing indoors, or you've gone out west and done some rock climbing or rappelling. And when you go over the edge of the cliff, your entire life is by the rope. If that rope breaks, you're gone. But the truth that we can trust in is that God's Grace, God's chesed, God's mercy toward us won't stop. It's new. It won't, it's new every morning. It's like waves on a seashore. It won't fail. God's love 
is trustworthy. You can put your entire life into, the, into God's hands, and He will never let you go. He will never let you go. It continues in the next phrase is the crux of this entire book, the book of Lamentations. It says, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's the heart of the book. God, I feel pain. I feel suffering. I feel fear. I feel uncertainty. The blurring of this season is gripping my mind and keeping me up at night and giving me depression during the day. But in that moment, I will still say, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. And I'm going to put my life into God's hands. I can hang on Jesus. I can hang on God in Christ, the Messiah, Rescuer, Savior, Re Savior, Redeemer. And I know that he will not let me go. His mercies are new every morning. More reliable than the sunrise. We count on it, don't we? We count on the sun to come up every day. And Jeremiah reminds himself, this I recall to my mind. And today we have to recall this to our minds, that his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, fresh, reliable, even more than the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. His name will be praised. His power is great. He is faithful to his people. And so the call of Lamentations chapter 3 is be faithful to the faithful God. You and I can live with restored hope by reflecting back on God's faithfulness in the past as we look forward to His grace for the future. We can live with this restored hope, reflect back on God's faithfulness to you and the past to live with restored hope for the future. And my question for you is what or how has God's faithfulness been shown to your life in the past. Think about that for a moment. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then it continues, the Lord is my portion, that I have everything that I need. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, that from the depths of your soul, you have to say it. You have to say it. You have to say, the Lord is my portion. And that reminds us of David's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want for anything. It means I don't need anything else. If I have God as my shepherd who's going to guide me through life, who's going to lead me to green pastures, who's going to shepherd me, correct me, provide for me, even through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for he is with me. So that is the Lord is my shepherd. And this is why even Job said in chapter 13, I believe in verse 5, he said, he said, even though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. I will yet praise you. Because my life is hidden in God. But we can trust in God's integrity. You know, we wonder if our government leaders are trustworthy. And some of us like to sound off on social media. And I don't either side of the political arena or in between, it doesn't matter. I wonder, you wonder, are they really trustworthy? Do they really have integrity? No matter which political party. But you know what? Here's what we can do. When we put our trust in God's integrity, we can honor the leaders that God has appointed because our trust isn't in them. Our trust is in the God who appointed them. You get that? We can honor our government leaders, no matter what decisions they might make. Our trust is not in their integrity, which certainly, for every human being, is faulty. But our trust is in the God who will not fail, who will not falter. Our trust is in the God who will not let us go, who will not let us fall on our faces without his love and mercy and presence. And so we can trust in him, and then our trust is in his integrity, not and some human, but we can honor them because God has appointed them for the task that they have, regardless of our opinion of their decisions. So God's people can fully trust and be faithful because he is faithful. The Lord is my portion. 
therefore I have hope in him. Look with me at verse 20, 21. It says, therefore I have hope, because I've recalled this to mind. It's repeated, encapsulating the crux, the centerpiece of this song of lamentation. It says, therefore I have hope in him again in verse 24. Therefore, my hope, my rest, my trust is in him, because I'm reflecting back on God's faithfulness. Therefore, I can live with restored hope for the future. Because God is my portion. His loving kindnesses never fail. His mercies don't stop. They're more reliable than the sunrise. My life is secure in Christ, God's Messiah. These seasons of uncertainty and suffering are a time to lament our losses. These seasons of suffering and uncertainty are a time to trust in God's integrity. And these seasons of uncertainty and suffering are a time to wait on God's salvation. Let me tell you, though, waiting is not in my sweet spot. I've never been really good at waiting, you know. You can ask my mom. You can ask my dad. I, I, I like to run forward and get things done and set about plans and work on it and finish it, check off boxes but in the season of uncertainty and suffering, our waiting on God demonstrates our trust and our recognition that we can't fix this. We can't solve this. We can't save ourselves. We can't rescue ourselves. We can't solve this problem. We can't fix the coronavirus crisis without God doing what only God can do. Yes, as medical professionals cry out to God for wisdom and wait on Him. Wait on Him. How do we wait on Him? Let's look and see what Jeremiah reminds us of. It says, the Lord is good. He's tov. That's the Hebrew word. Good in the most intrinsic sense, core to God's being, an essence of His character that God is good, that the Yahweh is good to those who, there it is, wait for Him. Wait for him. When everything seems lost, when all hope is gone, when happiness or unrest is just a mixed up blur in your life, wait for him. Wait for him. Oh, people of God, wait for God. Be faithful to the faithful God. The next verse reminds us of the same phrase. To the person who seeks him, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. The season of uncertainty and suffering is a time to wait on God's salvation. Psalm 130 reminds us of this in a different angle, different camera shot on this. It says, out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Sounds a lot like Jeremiah in Lamentations. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. It, this psalm was written by someone who trusted that God would hear. And at the same time, emotionally lamenting the, the fact that suffering, that pain, that hurt is real. I'm crying out to the Lord. And then in verse 5 is the resolution to that. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is, and there's our word again, loving kindness, chesed, his loyal, unstoppable, always and forever love for his people. And with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all her iniquities. Hope flows from waiting and trusting. Not a, I hope so, but a confident, resolute hope in the God who provides, in the God full of mercy and love. My kids go in the back seat when we're on a road trip. Last summer, we drove all the way down to Florida. It was sort of a nightmare. It was a long, long, long drive with three little kids. And at that point, you know, still one fully in diapers. And, and it was, I don't know how many times I heard, Daddy, are we there yet? Papa, are we there yet? I say, wait, Hudson, wait, Everlyn, wait, Carson, wait on God. 
We're crying out, how long, Lord? Which is even how this book ends. Not a why, but a how long, Lord. And we cry out to God. And we wait on him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. You know, scientists, they, they talk about a sp space-time continuum. Astrophysicists, I'm not one. I'm not even going to posture that I know anything about the space-time continuum, although I find it fascinating. And the space-time continuum represents our, our existence. The past, the present, and the future. The past, the present, and the future. And it hit me through studying Jeremiah's lamentation here that we're, we're concerned about the future. But this I do know. We may say, what will tomorrow bring? But we can know that the God who's ordered my past will guide my present and hold my future. The God who has ordered your past is guiding you right now, and he will hold your future. And you know, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says this, Jesus Christ, God's Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, come to save. He is the same, you know it, yesterday and today and forever. That connective word and is repeated there. There's no comma, just Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, that is the past, and today and forever, which means Jesus Christ covers the continuum of your life. He knows the future better than we know the past. He is with us in the, in the present because the God who has ordered our past will guide us in the present and he holds our future so we can trust in him and we can wait for him because Christ covers the continuum of our lives. So Mayfair Bible Church and other friends and family tuning in right now, I want to invite you to say it because all throughout this poem that Jeremiah is lamenting before God is this, I'm saying, my soul remembers. I'm, I'm saying this to my soul. I'm reminding of my, myself of this. I recall this to my mind. You need to say this. I need to say this. I have everything I need in God. All that God supplies is enough for my tomorrow. Would you say that with me right now? We just have a few scattered in the auditorium, our tech and worship people in your home right now with your wife, your husband, your children, your family, say, I have everything I need in God. Say that with me. All that God supplies is enough for my tomorrow. Say that. And then here's what I want you to invite you to do. I want you to write it. Jeremiah wrote down. He wrote down what he was feeling. He wrote down what God had done in the past. He wrote down what he was going through right then. And he wrote down how his trust would be in God for the future and so I want to invite you to answer this question with your family, with your Thrive group later on. How has God shown his faithfulness to you in the past? I want to invite you to do this right now because there's hundreds tuning in right now on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Comment right now. How has God shown his faithfulness to you in the past? Say it. Write it down so that we can help each other recall how God has been faithful to us. Because when we reflect back on God's faithfulness in the past, we have restored hope for the future. Now this book, throughout the pages, we find the faithful often asking why and how. At the end, it's not why though, it's how long, Lord, Maranatha, soon come, Lord Jesus. We wait on God's salvation. A season of suffering and blurring uncertainty is a time to lament our losses and do that honestly before God because he can fully receive them with his patient love. And number two, it's a time to trust in God's integrity, not in ourselves, not even our government leaders. We can honor them because our trust is in God's integrity, not in theirs. And number three, it's a time to wait on God's salvation. We can't rescue or save ourselves, but God alone saves. 
And what God has done in the past is a promise and a model for the future. But he's too creative to do it the same way twice. So God is guiding us. Say it, write it, shout it out now. Tell everybody in the church family, everybody in the live stream, how has God shown his faithfulness to you? And all of this guides us then to remember what Christ has done. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to enter into communion in the Lord's Supper, which is a time to remember what Christ has done. Christ covers the continuum. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the God who saves, and as he saved us through his death on the cross for our sins in our place, he called us to remember what he had done so that we live with restored hope until he comes. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your mercy and love. We thank you, oh God, that we can gather around your table, the table of all those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we pray, oh God, that you would guide us and guard us as you have promised us. You are the covenant-keeping God. Even when we fail, you remain faithful. Even when we are faithless, you are steadfast. And we trust in you. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Through summer and winter, season and harvest, you are the faithful, faithful Jesus, we pray to you, our Father. Amen.